there was a joke that we used to say uh, when we were younger, and we would say, tell we would tell somebody that they couldn't get wherever they were asking to go from here, that it was impossible. Um, and it was something that when you think about it as you get older, and especially as a Christian, when we hopefully truly understand this path that we're on, there are certain pathways that we can't do without God. The reason why I named this order my steps, you can't get there from here, but he can. So we have to recognize we need him to get to where we need to be. So what are those things that we need to get to that I'm talking about? And, and I think it's going to hit with a lot of people because we go through things in life and then we try to get where we need to be to deal with them. Right. It, so giving you some examples, how do we correctly deal with the following? struggling with trials. How do we as, as human beings deal with that? Dealing with temptation and sin. Are we able to, you know, get ourselves in a place that we don't sin and, you know, temptation has no control over us? Stress with dealing with problems. Are all of us stress-free? I don't care what happens. We're just cool. Everything's good. And anything like the above. I just gave a few. But the question I'm asking, can we truly get to a satisfactory place, satisfactory or whatever spot in which we are where we need to be in these categories? Now, we may take medication. We may have the frame of mind to think we are while in reality it's eating us up. But I do uh, want to let you know that we can get to where we need to be in dealing with all of these things as long as we go through him. Now, understand the secret to dealing with these things and not have them deal with you is to truly allow God to deal with it for you. How do you do that? Because now in saying that, you're going to get those Christians that say, I gave it to God. Now, and they don't know what that means. That's a whole nother Bible study. But that's kind of this is going to dive into that a little bit, because how we give it to God and how we allow God to take it and deal with it. We have to trust him and do what he says. It's almost an action reaction in which, as I'm doing what he says, he'll take care of this stuff over here that I can't, if that makes sense. Now, let's be clear. Only those in Christ can correctly deal with troubles. OK, only those, because remember, the only way to God is through Christ. Psalm 9, 9 through 10 says the Lord is a refuge. Watch this for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And then he shows it here in verse 10. Those who know your name will trust in you. For you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. So those who know your name, because like I say, a lot of people kind of uh, add God into their concept of God. They create what they think God should be. They deal with God on their own structure, but not the way God says it. They don't know God. But as we use his word and we grow and we get to know him and we access him based on who he says he is, then we'll truly trust in him. We're looking for what he has to say. God warns us that all troubles are spiritually driven. Therefore, we must deal with them spiritually. So all those things I'm talking about, Christians know if we know God, hey, that's a spiritual issue. This is a difference. Now, if you notice somebody, like I said, when they're dealing with a person and they deal with that person, the way the world deals with that person, they don't get it. They missed it, totally missed it. But when you see somebody dealing with that person and realize that is spiritual, that's how they can still love that person and deal with the whole entire situation spiritually. In Ephesians 6, 11 through 13, he says, put on the full armor of God. That study in itself is such an important one because it shows us how to put on our spiritual attire and it covers every aspect of our spiritual walk and every item that we need. He says we do this so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. The devil wants you to look at it as flesh and blood. The devil wants you to deal with it as flesh and blood. And unfortunately, more than not, do. They give in and they deal with it on how they see not on what God says. What does God say? He says in verse 12, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Um, and so he shows us where it's coming from. Now, just a warning, because there are people who have written books on these spiritual forces that are out there. Unfortunately, the Bible doesn't tell too much more about that. We just know, he's letting us know, these are the sp spiritual forces all around us in every uh, uh, different place and how it attacks. And they're using flesh and blood uh, to manifest what, you know, the actual problem. It's trying to attack us using that weapon. If somebody threw something at you, you don't take and, and, and fight the thing that was thrown at you. No, it was the person that threw it at you. OK, so in the same way, the things that are attacking you are behind the scenes using the things that you see. That's why he says in verse 13, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, in other words, you're going to keep having these days that they're going to come. You may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand. So you have did what he said. When it says after you've done everything to stand, you did what he said. He got you. That's what the armor of God shows us, right? Like I said, I'm not going to do that entire study. I have to do that sometime in the future, but I encourage you to go and read it. But understanding that the have uh, the full armor lets us get that strong understanding and 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 realize how every aspect of of item that we wear deals with how we're going to deal with things in life. It's the spiritual part of dealing with it. Christians, unfortunately, deal with spiritual matters with human solutions, like I was saying earlier. Too many times we keep fighting it as if it's just flesh and blood. And he showed in Colossians 2, 20 through 23, and, and we see this in church today, in which more and more churches are implementing ideas, practices, uh, uh, workshops. Um, they're adding different uh, um, preps and things for people to try, and they all look good. And, and the Bible warned us about these. He says, since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? We, we've been asking this question for a while. He's saying, so why are you doing it that way? The Bible said do this. Yeah, but it didn't look like it was working. That's what I'll hear people say. Well, this really showed. It really followed. It made me feel. We keep allowing the flesh to dictate what we're doing next. And he says, so then we do stuff where he says, uh, in, in verse 21, do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, in which we make up these physical rules. Sound great. Do you understand that? And I'm not saying ban all of them. I'm saying, but these are not going to be the solve, the, what's going to solve the problem. It's not going to be that. He says, these are all destined to perish with use. Why? Because they're based on human commands and teachings. You get some doctor with some degrees and instead of them, and I'm talking about a doctor who's supposed to be a godly man, but they're leaning more on their degrees and their human teachings than they are on the word of God. That's the problem. And you'll hear them making things that really sound good. That's why it says in verse 23, such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom. Do you see that? Have an appearance of wisdom. Of wisdom. What does that mean when it says an appearance of wisdom? So understanding that they look wise and you get some people that will just go with that. And we have applied them to our lives and I'm doing them and it seems like it's working. And he said, no, they're perishing because they lack what's needed in order to solve the problem. And, and they usually look wise because they'll come with their self-imposed worship, as it says, their false humility and their harsh treatment of the body. They'll do things that will give the impression where you're going, wow, that person's really holy, if you don't understand what holiness is. But he makes very clear they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. When it says that sensual indulgence, it's not just talking about sex. It's talking about anything that is passion led, anything that is desire moved. And, and, and so it, it, it's saying these things, when you make these rules and you put them into places, they don't work against a spiritual attack. That's why when people join the, you know, these clubs and things like that to get after, you know, to get, to get rid of an addiction, to deal with things, it, it's a nice, comfortable setting. It may have some surface value, but if the overall thing of me becoming spiritual to really battle this thing that's going to be there forever, I, I need God 100%. I don't need human and sprinkle some God on top. That means I'm, I'm, I'm not really following God. Now here's a question. How do we let God deal with these struggles? First of all, 
We must not be motivated by emotion, but be motivated by trust in God. When he says in John 14, 1, and I told you it was one of the early things that I struggled with because it didn't seem like he gave me an answer. Once again, as I grew to know him better, it was, it was the answer. When he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, he let me know I have that access. Trust in God, trust also in me. The one thing I had to learn throughout the Bible is I was taught in the world that my heart was that feeling I have in here. So that's why when you get that deep feeling, we allow our feelings to dictate who we are. Feeling is flesh. Feelings are flesh. You understand that, okay? My heart is my purpose. My heart is my purpose. So when he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, in other words, so every Christian's purpose or heart should be God. All right, we did a study on it where we kind of showed how it all came together. It's supposed to be God. He says, don't let that be troubled because what ends up happening is if I have the wrong vision of God or understanding of God, the minute God goes against what I think, then I tend to stop. And you see people doing that. They don't go to church as much. They start adding other aspects in there. They start doing other things. They start falling away. When he says, do not let your hearts be troubled, trust in God, trust also in me. It means even when it doesn't make like make sense, even when the outcome wasn't the most desirable, trust him. Trust him. He says, we must let go of peace based on the world and take hold of peace of God. In John 14, 27, he says, peace, I leave with you. My peace, I give you. So we have this full access to something of Christ. He said, I'm going to give you a peace, and it's going to have nothing to do with the situation. Still, once again, too many people go off a of feeling. Well, I don't feel any better. Those people are still around. I'm still going through those struggles. He didn't say he would take that away. He said, I'm going to give you this element that you're going to be able to go through it and its effect on you. But if I'm still living for that effect, then I missed it. He says, I do not give you as the world gives. See, the world tries to adjust your situations. He says, once again, do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. And he's saying that because you're going to feel that way. At times, you're going to feel that way. Anybody here who's trying to cater to or adjust or fix their feelings, that's why so many of us are on depression pills and other medications to help our anxieties and things of that sort, because they're, they're real and they exist. But we allow that we give them more strength than what they really have. And we shouldn't do that. Thirdly, we must do all things in God's grace and remove self. You understand that? All things in God's grace. You have some people that will have certain godly things and the rest of things they've done what they've always done. And you're still going to struggle and not be able to get to where you need to be. Second Corinthians 12, 9 to 10 says, but he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. Now, think about what we just what we were talking about. If I go off of feeling the minute I have this trial and this thing that makes me weak, I'm done because I don't like the way it makes me feel. But he just said, wait a minute, you do know all you need is my grace. And in fact, you have more access to my grace when you're out the way. So sometimes these things that we're going through are great because it removes me. That's what he's saying. My power is made perfect in weakness. Sometimes I, I, I need you. Most times I need you out the way. And you may say, why does he give us strength? He gives us strength to trust in him. My strength wasn't made for me to solve the problem. No, my strength was me to trust in him and use it as he says to use it. That's why Paul said, therefore, I will boast all the more uh, um, gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. I don't want you to come out trying to be the hero, trying to solve it on your own, trying to be independent. No, the world wants us to become more and more independent. Well, God wants us to become more and more dependent. If we would stay dependent, the fruit wouldn't have been eaten. But they became independent and said, well, I think it looks good, so I'm going to eat. This is verse 10. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. All those things I read earlier fall into one of these categories. And they do add a weakness to us because it harms us as far as we feel, because it takes us out of the comfort. It adds hurt. And like he said here, but his grace is sufficient. I, I, you just need my grace because we understand for when I am weak, then I am strong. So his grace 
we have to maintain, stay focused on, not me going out and trying to do it myself. And then we have to let go of everything you depend on, including self, and completely depend on God. When Proverbs 3, 5 through 8, and in the three different ways that it really kind of sections this off, when it first says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, that means, as we've seen earlier, just trust him. I go through some things right now that I'm still looking at, and in my eyesight, I'm shaking my head like, this, this makes no sense. You know what I mean? I'm like, man, this makes no sense, right? But I keep doing what he says. Why? Because I trust him. I'm not saying I'm not going to feel different, but my feelings don't dictate how I'm to be. I'm just doing what he says. And then in order to do that, he says, and lean not on your own understanding, which many blow it with. And because my understanding is usually flawed. When I hear people go, I can't see God doing that right there. They already blew it. Or my God wouldn't do that one right there. They already blew it. And I can go down the list of how we blow it with our own concept of God instead of a searching God. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. Why does he have to say in all your ways? Because we only go to God when we think we need him. But all the other ways, oh, no, I know where I'm going. You know what I mean? You ever get a baby when they get to that certain age and you can try to help them? I can do it. No, me do it. <laughs> they, they take it and let you know. No, no, I got it. Right? But that's that independence. But as Christians, he wants us to go, can you help me with this? Even though I did it before, I want you to help me with this because I want to make sure I'm doing what you told me to do. And then you allow him, it says, he will make your path straight. And then he gives something that we have to stop. Do not be wise in your own eyes. That's that seeing of the fruit, saying this is good. I'm going to eat it, even though he said no. Not be wise in my own eyes mean, and this is what scares me. There's a lot of stuff that I intellectually look at and go, why aren't we just doing this? And that's what scares me, because what I just thought is not in line with what he says. So that's all the more reason why I, I just go to him. I just want to hear and pull in what he says. So important. He says, this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. It's going to help a lot of people health-wise. Do you understand that? We don't realize stress and, and a lot of stuff causing cancers and um, other diseases in people's lives, but a lot of it comes from because we keep trying to deal with things and our body can't take it. But the, the true medicine we get from him is trusting in God. Then we have to take all of our issues to him and thank him for his answer, if you like it or not. First of all, we must truly give our anxieties to God, truly give it to him. OK, don't just say I'm going to give it to him. No, no, we have to truly give it to him. In first Peter five, verse seven, it says, cast all your anxieties on him. Keyword all cast all your anxieties on him. Now, what does it mean to cast on him? And not just you saying it, but you recognizing God's going to take care of it. So you pray to him, okay? Do what he says. There's going to be some little bit maybe in that thing that you're going through that you may have to do, but the rest of it you leave to him. Other things, you don't, none, nothing can, pertaining to that thing that you're dealing with, you have to do. Just do what he says over here, and he'll take care of it. That's what that means. And this is, you give him the anxieties. Why are you worried about? Let him deal with it. He says, because he cares for you. And then he gives more instruction in, in Philippians 4, where it shows us how we have to deal with anxieties by giving to God and doing it God's way. When he says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything. And he breaks it down um, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So we have this prayer, once again, which we should be doing, talking to God daily. Petitioning is put it all out there. Let him know. God, this is what I'm going through. I'm struggling with this. I thought I was going to do it this way, but I'll make sure I'm doing what your word says. We're putting that out there. We're explaining the whole thing to him, showing how much we trust in him. And then we thank him. Not thank you for giving me what I asked for, but thank you for being there. Thank you for being my God. Thank you for whatever answer you do give me. We got to put all that out there. That's how we present the request to God. And here's the promise he does give if we do that. In verse 7, and the peace of God, remember we talked about that earlier, which transcends all understanding. That's why we go through that list and you look at it and go, yeah, I'll probably go through that. Yeah, I'll probably go through that. Why? Because your stuff is focused on God. But you're going to have this peace that you can go through that. Those things will not influence you as it would somebody who lives by the flesh. He says, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, what will it do? Will guard your hearts and your minds 
in Christ Jesus. So your heart is your purpose and your mind is the path you take. And he's saying all of that will be protected and guarded within Christ Jesus. Right. So we got to make sure that's what we're trusting in and we're leaning upon that. Right. And it's going to put it in him and in only in him. And we have to make sure we have that. So we have to uh, make sure we're covering that, um, that we're covering that and that we are being guarded within him and that we are are staying within him. Because that's where our protection and everything is. So it's important that I stay in him. It's important that I'm in my refuge, in, 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 in uh, the one who protects me, in my fortress, which is in Christ. So that's what it does. This peace of God keeps me where I'm protected. Because what ends up happening is when you go into anxiety and you deal with it in a fleshly way, you go outside of protection. And this is where people get even more attacked. Keep this in mind. Very, very important for us to know that. And lastly, and this one's going to take a little time, so we'll break this down. We must know he is God. So remember earlier, it says those who know your name. How do we know that? Okay. We have to make him our purpose and truly see the world for what it is. I think we have to take our vision and really focus on God and it must be God. In every aspect and everything of the way, it got to be, it got to fall on God and only God. James 4, 7 through 10 says, submit yourselves then to God. All right. That's the first part. Submit yourselves then to God. Remember, submission is yield to and yielding is an understanding of each other's position. He is the almighty God. He is everything. The alpha and the omega. OK, so everything about God and he's our provider. Uh, so we have to realize in every case of God, we submit to that. If he says it, we do it. He's one main one that we obey. So when this is submit yourselves then to God, I'm searching God so I can do what God wants me to do, right? I do how God wants me to handle it. Submit yourselves then to God. But then he also says something, resist the devil. Do you remember, once again, the whole Adam and Eve thing comes back to that story over and over again, how first Eve listened to what uh, um um, Satan said, but she gave the right answer. So she kind of submitted, saying we're not supposed to eat from the tree, but she kept listening to him. Where's his resist the devil? You just go, no. Remember the right way of doing it where Jesus kept going, it is written. He, he, in other words, Jesus kept going, God said, but God said, sorry, God said. And how it should have been handled, right? You resist him. And this is, if you do that, he will flee from you. Look at the end of that in Matthew 4, how it says, and, 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 and the devil left him. Next, he says, and this is how God works with us. He's always there for us. He never leaves us, never forsakes us. But when I run away, he's not going chasing after me, right? God is there for me to access. So when he says, come near to God, when I'm going and I'm reading my word, when I'm studying all this stuff, OK, so when this is come near to God, and I put all these step by step in there just kind of, so you can kind of think about it when you're when you're listening to this again. Come near to God means exactly that. I, I, as I'm praying, I'm coming near to him. When I'm getting an understanding of the word, I'm coming near to him. When I'm applying the word, I'm coming near to him. That's me making my move to show that I truly trust in him. That's me showing my faith in action, showing my belief. It says I do that. He will come near to you action, reaction, then I'll get that response. He'll be then there with me because of me coming towards him. Then when he says, wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your heart, you double-minded, the washing your hands, you sinners, is you still have, I'm a Christian, but I'm still a sinner. So we try to straddle. We try to do both, not realizing it's corrupting our lives and really causing things to be uh, blurred and gives us the problems. And then he says, purify your hearts. Remember, your heart is your purpose. And every Christian should be God. But you have too many that is God and my kids, God and my job, God and my happiness, God and my loneliness. Do you see where I'm coming from? In other words, you think you're serving two gods, even though he warned us you can't do that. You can't be double-minded. I can't be sometime, be at this spot and do that spot only, and then ignore God. Then he says something here that I think we tend to, to miss that we don't fully understand. He tells us what sounds like become depressed, but it's not. Spiritually, hopefully you get this. When he says grieve, mourn, and wail, 
change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. What he's letting us understand is we allow the world to give the impression, man, this is all you need. It's all good here. What are you doing? So we start searching and making this life life. All right. But when I recognize what we're really in, how evil the world is, how doomed I was beforehand, what's going on with so many people that are headed to hell and how, you know, what can we do with, with the time, the short time and all of this? That'll give us to grieve more than well. It'll make us act more in reality of what God is showing us than for us to be so busy trying to enjoy ourselves. I've seen people who needed somebody to talk to. And then I've seen somebody else who thought they were having a quote unquote good day and was like, I'm not going to let them ruin my day. And they turned the other way. Their laughter was what they required more than them looking and going, my brother needs help. We'd see and be more available to others if we keep, if we stop just looking for our own happiness. And then he ends it with something that I think all of us must uh, um, um, really press to do. Humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. Humble yourselves before. True humility is you just going and you are whatever he says. I think in many times we like to call the shots. I told you when we used to play um, at school, our coach would tell us what place we're playing. And the one coach we had, he was no joke. He just said, you play over here, you play. I didn't care how good he thought you were. And one thing I liked about him is, you know, most coaches had their favorites and they had the people that, you know, I'm always going to put him here. I'm always going to put, no, every time we came to the gym, he put us in different spots. He didn't care what we said. He's the coach. Do you understand that? So you humble yourself. You just went there and did the best you can. And that's where the trust in him comes. There's a reason why he put me here. There's a reason why I'm going through this thing. Do you understand that? You don't complain about it. You uh, um, glorify him in it. Many times we make the mistake of allowing it to dictate us. Just humble yourselves and allow him, it says, and he will lift you up. Allow him to do the lifting. These paths that we need to get to, hopefully we understand and we realize that we only can get to it through God. And we only get to God through Christ. And we have to make that decision. He doesn't force us. It doesn't just automatically happen. But he offers this access and he offers this path to us. In order for you to get to what may seem and may be impossible to humans, you must take the path of God. Let us pray. Dear most heavenly, most gracious Father, thank you so much, dear Lord, for offering us that path. Help us to get clarity and understanding and not uh, be misled by our own feelings and um, get caught up in what we think it should be instead of rec recognizing and grasping what it is. We thank you so much, dear Lord, for your love. We thank you so much even for the trials we go through because as we know, it provides us access to that your power may rest on us. So we, we want to have your power and not our power that we're leaning upon. We give you the glory praise and the honor and all these blessings we asked in your son and our savior, Jesus Christ's name, we say, amen.